Welcome everyone to another episode of the STC under the banner of the National Council's new podcast, Interpreting in Healthcare. Today we have a two-parter. We are going to be speaking with the current and past chair of the NBCMI, the credentialing body for healthcare interpreters. And I'm really excited about that because I think that certification is so important and the dialogue between the two certifying bodies, I think needs to be encouraged because we all are pursuing the same goals, which is quality interpreting, continuing education, and most importantly, certification for healthcare interpreters. So joining me today is our co-host, Maria Schweder. She's a registered nurse with a master's degree in mental health counseling. Maria was raised in Bolivia, coming to the U.S. when she was 20 years old. Maria is also the president and founder of Medical Communications Ambassadors, the mission of which is to provide innovative and quality interpretation training services to a diverse population with regional, organizational, and individual needs. The mission of MCA's training program is to serve as a stepping stone to careers in medical interpreting. Maria is author of MCA's Spanish English Medical Interpreters course and MCA's textbooks, which are accredited by the IMIA. Maria has extensive experience working as a healthcare provider. She's been a critical care nurse, emergency room trauma nurse specialist, diabetes educator, CPR, PALS and ACLS instructor, a mental health counselor and nursing instructor as well as interpreter trainer. And she's a certified healthcare interpreter, CHI, and has worked as a medical interpreter since 2000. Maria served on the board of directors of the Midwest Association of Translators and Interpreters, MATI, International Medical Interpreters Association, IMIA, chair of the National Board of Certified Medical Interpreters, NBCMI, and the National Council of Interpreters in Healthcare, NCIHC. She is a member of American Translators Association, ATA founder and president of the Northern Indiana Medical Interpreters Association, NIMIA, and currently works with me on the Standards and Training Committee at NCIHC. So thanks for being the co-host today, Maria. Our first guest in part one of today's podcast is Gustavo Negrete, who is the current chair of NBCMI. He had previously served as its secretary. He's also the president and CEO of a micro interpreting and translation company, fulfilling language access needs in medical, legal, community, and education, as well as consulting as the new manager, excuse me, as the new managing director of trans interpreting. Senor Negrete has over 20 years of experience in healthcare, having served in several clinical roles and departments prior to becoming an interpreter. He's a staunch advocate for language access, LEP rights, and the interpreting profession as an active participant in organizations who lobby and or promote these causes. So thanks for joining us today, Gustavo. Thanks for being my co-host today, Maria. I'm going to lurk in the background now and you guys can get going. All right. All right. Well, it's good to Thank see you, you Gustavo. Good to see you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Oh, I'm so nice so to finally you. meet you. <laughs> I know. Yeah, finally. <laughs> so we have a few questions for you. Sure, sure. Um, Absolutely. Looking back into the past and your experiences, what, what are the things that you are most proud of? The interpreter? Mm. Well, um, I'm going to span quite a few things here with uh what i'm what's looking back and what i'm most proud of uh looking back um i'm proud that uh uh i had the upbringing that i did uh not too many people know this but i actually grew up in south central la uh more specifically in compton and so to be where i am at right now is actually you know quite a uh uh it's quite contrasting you know no one expects a uh a uh, young, uh, especially uh, Mexican male, um, coming from Compton to achieve the things that he has, owning a company now, um, 
have a modest staff. And then, of course, I recently became the managing director through acquisition of uh, Trans Interpreting. So that's one thing that I'm very proud of. The other thing that I'm very proud of is, of course, um, having had the experience uh, working, uh, serving under uh, your next guests, uh, uh, tutelage uh, Xiomara Armas as the uh, as she was the previous chair of the uh, the national of the NBCMI. Um, she was an amazing chair. I learned a lot from her, especially uh, the inner workings of the NBCMI. And of course, I continue to learn from her, as you know, we we still stay in contact and uh, constantly bounce the ideas off of each other. Um, something else that I'm proud of, looking back, is of course. Um, I'm going to say somewhat accidentally stumbling across interpreting. It's been able to afford me uh, what we what I have now. So currently, what do you see as your biggest challenge right now? Um, well, another thing that not too many people know of is that I'm actually a new dad. Yeah, I have sorry. an eight month, You're a new father. Oh, congratulations! Mm -hmm. I'm a new father. Um, I have an eight-month-old daughter. Her name is Victoria, and uh, she she's the light of my life. You know, I, I've always wanted children, and it was a and it was a, a blessing that this was a that this was a that this was able to happen. So, um, so that's something that uh, yeah. The reason I mentioned that it's challenging is because uh, I didn't expect it to be this challenging to be able to balance everything and still be. Uh, uh, uh to, to, to try to be uh, again um uh, you know to be able to um balance everything the national board work life and and of course a, a new a new child um so that's that's particularly challenging uh yeah, that's one of the things that's challenging right now um but on a different level and some of the other challenges that i foresee or that I that I see and foresee is of course uh, relating to interpreting. Um, there are there are you know a lot of legislative changes that are in the works. Um, things that have current that have recently passed legislative legislatively in other states. Um, some positive and some not so much. Um, and I kind of see that as. Uh, Again, from the perspective of being an active participant in, in such organizations, one of them, I know I don't have it listed in my bio, but one of them is, is the American Association for Professional Translators and Interpreters, whom they actually work with a lobbyist um, to effect change legis legislatively. All of, of course, this is all pro-interpreting uh, and language access, which is one of the biggest reasons why um, I became a member of that organization. So, um, so on the challenges front, that's something that is uh, I uh, look forward to actually uh, meeting with different legislators and um, different committees. And um, but I'm always up for a good challenge. So that's always a that's always a uh, I see it's I see it as a positive more so than as the than a negative. And what what are some of the challenges you face as far as being the chair of, of the uh, NBCMI? Oh, uh, some of those challenges are, truth be told, I think um, I think sometimes we take a little long in in getting things moving. Sometimes I think that that that's one of the biggest challenges. And um, we are the national board is a team of volunteers. Um, that's actually one of the things that uh, is, I guess, maybe little known, or perhaps maybe not understood uh, by the, com the interpreting community at large is that when you are part of, you know, organizations, and in, in my case, the national board being the chair, um, these are volunteer positions. These aren't things that uh, are paid for, you know, so uh, when you when you enter into this wholeheartedly, you, you you go in with the understanding that you're trying to affect change in the interpreting industry as a whole, um, and you're doing so as a volunteer. 
Yeah. So it's a full-time job on a full-time job <laughs> on a full-time job. So. Yeah. Good for you. Um, and looking forward, what would you like to see ha happen in the future with all of the um, certification and training and all of this? I would like to see, of course, the, the obvious one would be to see more certified interpreters. Um, I would also like to see healthcare organizations uh, prioritize the hiring of certified interpreters. Um, I should say certified and credentialed interpreters, because I know not every language has a certification or certification process. Um, but uh, I, that's something that I would actually like to see. In fact, I, I uh, commend um, all of the... Uh, hospitals and hospital organizations that do hire certified interpreters and all, almost exclusively. And I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing, uh, not only for interpreters and the interpreting community, but also for uh, our LEPs. Mm -hmm. um, something else that I'd like to see is a, a more collaborative and unified front, especially amongst our, our you know, the various organizations that, uh, that, in, that do exist and promote certification, promote uh, language access and uh, and uh, interpreting as a whole. Um, I think there's been, uh, at least from my perspective, uh, before joining the board, mind you, um, that there isn't so much collaboration. There's like everybody's kind of in their own camps and, and uh, and at times on soapboxes, but there's not really too much collaboration. That's one thing that I would actually like to see change um, is more um, unity amongst the uh, the interpreting organizations. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Gustavo. It was a pleasure having you on our podcast today. And thank you for coming and sharing with us. Thank you. Of course. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And we're not quite done yet, because I would like to round back a little bit on one of the earliest things that you said that you stumbled into interpreting kind of accidentally. And I would like to hear a little bit more about that, because I find that in the interpreting world, we have the heritage speakers, we have the native speakers, we have the people who as adults learn the language so proficiently that they be can become interpreters. But not everyone started out with the goal of becoming an interpreter. So I'd like to hear more about how you ended up and found yourself as the interpreter. For me, it was because I interpreted for a family member as a child. Big no-no, but that's what gave me my impetus to start a career as interpreting. I really enjoyed getting people to connect and seeing the understanding reach the other side. But what happened with you that you suddenly found yourself doing an interpreter's task? Well, um, much much like you, Liana, actually, I, I too was a child interpreter. Um, my parents were migrants here to the U.S. from Mexico. And of course, um, my sister and I being the older ones, um, we... Uh, we oftentimes found ourselves in having to interpret for our parents because most prior, uh, most of the providers, of course, English speaking, and very little was done actually regarding, you know, the uh, the communication front for my parents. So therefore, we were kind of uh, left there with our parents looking at us uh, and looking at what did they say, did he on? You know, and we're always and then we're like, well, they said this. Um. But that that didn't prompt me to to want to be an interpreter. In fact, my my original goals in life were to be either a firefighter or or a president. <laughs> so that, those those were my goals. And uh, actually, I, I did live out the firefighter one. I was a reserve firefighter, but due to injury, I was no longer able to pursue that career. Um, and. I happen to be president of my own company now. So that's that kind of, you know, I think mission Before accomplished. President. So I, yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, but I was looking for a career change in, in healthcare is what ended up happening. I had already been in EMT for about 13 years by this point when I was like, I need to be, I need to do something different. 
I've always been pulled in and out of rooms to to be an, an, an ad hoc interpreter. Um, and in fact, I've always known that there were interpreters around. I just didn't know what they were called. I just like everyone else, I used the uh, the incorrect uh, terminology or nomenclature, and I and I kept calling her, thinking they were translators. Everyone, right? So uh, it wasn't until I started working at one hospital in particular, uh, St. Joseph's Hospital in Orange, that I actually met interpreters, and they encouraged me to pursue this as a career i watched them observed them they I've actually I, they the the department allowed me to shadow some of the interpreters and uh and i would see what they would do and i would ask questions and i really started uh to look at it as a very very much a viable uh career option for myself and um in fact, at one point at the same working at the same hospitals, they had a, I guess, a quasi volunteer interpreter program um, where they uh, would assess bilingual staff members to make sure that they, you know, their their fluency was up to par to be able to interpret. And then, of course, we were tested to, uh, to interpret in uh, at least one mode, which was generally the consecutive mode. Um, and having successfully completed that, I was just like, you know what, I think I really want to do this. I went to school at Cal State University Fullerton in the extended education program, uh, where I did get trained to be a court interpreter, but, um, I took advantage of my, med my medical background and I was, I got certified as a medical interpreter. Wow. That's a great story. And it shows people that it's never too late to switch horses, to change careers and do something. And you came from a career as an EMT or firefighter that also was very invested in helping others. So mm -hmm. I can't really say that you move from a career like say banking to interpreting where you would get greater job satisfaction. But yeah, no. Which one provides provided the most job satisfaction for you? I would imagine saving somebody from a fire would be right up at the top, but who knows? I'd like to hear from you. Um, they're both, I would say they're both equally satisfying, but on different fronts. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, I, you know, being a, a reserve firefighter and then having, having been an EMT, um, you, you get, the adrenaline rush from doing all of that, in addition to the job satisfaction is that I help someone. Being an interpreter, don't get me wrong, I do get a little bit of an adrenaline rush being an interpreter <laughs> still, but uh, but it's different. And uh, the, the truthfully, it's the, um, the switching of tasks and modalities and uh, word searching and, and you know, syntax, uh, uh, synthesizing syntax, all of that stuff, that that all actually gives me a rush too. So that therefore, uh, I still feel that that little buzz from doing that. And then uh, in addition to that, I'm equally satisfied that yes, I got to help somebody too. That's great. And you know that not only speaking more than one language, but studies have shown that working as an interpreter because you're accessing all areas of your brain so frantically as you're trying to deliver that message with all of the detail and all of the nuance that the speaker imparted in their original utterance, it keeps your brain young. Mm -hmm. uh, it staves off uh, degenerative cognitive uh, issues. So we will be yelling at people when we're older very, very intelligently and very uh, cogently about what we want and what we need. So I encourage all of my uh, interpreter colleagues to continue with their continuing education and stay in the game as long as they can, because it's yeah. totally going to help you in your senior years, which are fast approaching for yeah. me. Well, I can tell you, um, being an interpreter is a harder job than being a trauma nurse specialist. Oh, yeah. Oh, big time. someone who's been in both sets of shoes, I really appreciate that uh, 
nugget of information. Wow. There is a relentlessness to the pace. You go from one to the other, to the other, to the other. And not all of them are, as we well know, are delivering good news, happy news. And it's a lot of balancing uh, intellectually, linguistically, emotionally. Um, and I just think it makes us the best version of ourselves, but that's my opinion. And one last question that I want to sure. round back because I share your opinion, uh, Gustavo, about the fact that there aren't enough certified interpreters and the two major certifying bodies for healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. We're not talking about the administrative office of the courts. There's 50 different ones that certify court interpreters, but for healthcare, it's CCHI and NBCMI. Yes. And regardless of how things got started, we're not there. We're in 2020, almost 23 now. And I would like to see some sort of reapproaching, uh, rapprochement, as it were, of the people that lead these organizations. I think we are too siloed. Um, so what do you think we can do about that? That's a very broad question. How, and, and the reason why I wanted to have both you and Xiomara as guests to start that dialogue, right? The people that started both of these organizations, CCHI and MBCMI, that leadership has gone on. There's new blood in positions of authority and that can take action. What can we do to promote unity of purpose, uh, of mission, of encouraging interpreters to become certified? Uh, I don't know, sharing of information so that we don't step on each other, but can broaden the horizons for the profession to a greater extent. That's what I would like to see. Actually, as, as uh, even prior to becoming chair, I, I shared your sentiment. So uh, historically, from what I what I understand is that there there has been outreach, but nothing's really budged. Nothing's really moved. And in part, uh, and, and if I can say it frankly, um, is because there was too much of the old guard. Okay. Um, now that there is new blood, there's a lot of us who uh, who actually view it as, you know, why don't we, why isn't there a future more collaboration? And what I can do for my part as the chair is I can actually reach out. Yeah. And I can actually uh, see where it is that we can actually collaborate on what fronts. Um, where, where, where do our interests, aside from certifying interpreters, where do our interests uh, intersect and where can we actually, you know, work together? collaboratively that's something that i would like to see and and in and uh, truth be told i think that's one of the things that uh uh we're gonna uh invest heavily into in in 2023 awesome well that's really good news for 2023 uh i know that for my part at least i'm i have an open door policy <laughs> let's see what we can do to just share information, share pay rates, share who is uh, requiring and new hires to be certified, and also share what we're working on. Why should we both develop a new test for the same language? I mean, Spanish makes sense because it's the number one in all 50 states, but for the other languages, like shouldn't, shouldn't we divide and conquer rather than repeat? I don't know. Uh, those are things I think that are ripe for discussion going forward. And Agreed. I, I thank you for your openness and willingness to have those conversations. And I will do my best to uh, spread that message so that we can bring lots of people that are willing to do the work together to the table. What mm -hmm. do you say? Oh, of course, I agree. Awesome. Well, it's been great chatting with you today. 
Gustavo, I really Likewise, thank, thank you for Gustavo. having me. About your background and knowing more about your goals. And hopefully we can find a way to make some of those goals align uh, between the two organizations. And National Council is always here to support interpreting in healthcare. Yes. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Maria, for being my co-host. And stay tuned, everyone, for part two, because we'll be speaking with Jamara Armas, the former chair of NBCMI, very soon. Stay tuned. <laughs>